I'm Jasmine Hagen's curator of lectures, courses, and concerts. Today, we firmly enter the contemporary world with an overview of the exhibition, Megacities Asia. We'll hear from the exhibition's two curators, Al Miner and Laura Weinstein. Before I introduce them, I wanted to draw your attention to the exhibition's fantastic catalog. <laughs> it's available in the bookstore for the member price of $18 and goes through the contemporary artists in the exhibition with really incredible photography of some of the works that are in the exhibition, but also other works uh, by the artists so that you can really get a sense of um, their place in contemporary art and the world as well as their local communities. Additionally, on May 19th, we will have an author event entitled Kumela uh, Mapping the Ephemeral City about a religious festival in India that happens on the Ganges and a city that's built to house, feed, provide medical care for millions of people that comes up every four years. And um, two Harvard professors have done a project mapping the city and produced an exhibition and catalog on that. So that will be on May 19th. And on May 11th, in conjunction, or sponsored by the Korea Foundation, we'll have uh, a lecture with one of the artists from Megacities Asia um, in conversation with Lucas Cohen from the Rose Kennedy Greenway, talking about art, uh, contemporary art and cities and bringing all these themes that happen in Megacities Asia into a very local and Boston-focused context. So to introduce today's speakers, Al Miner became the assistant curator of contemporary art at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston in fall 2010. Miner has curated several exhibitions, including Gonzalo Fuenmayor, Tropical Mythologies, DeWitt L. Petros, Sense of Place, and Ori Gersh's History Repeating, the first survey exhibition of the Israeli photographer and video artist, for which Miner authored an award-winning monograph of the same title. Prior to the MFA, Miner worked at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Smithsonian Museum, uh, Institution's Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Washington, D.C. Miner's passion for the art and artists of our time stems from his own background and practice as an artist. He was educated at Randolph College, Queens College, CUNY, and the, uh, the George Washington University. Laura Weinstein is Ananda Kumar Swami, curator of South Asian and Islamic art. She completed her PhD in 2011 at Columbia University. Since arriving at the MFA in 2009, she has curated several exhibitions of paintings and manuscripts, drawing on the museum's Islamic and South Asian collections. In 2011, she led the reinstallation of the museum's superb South and Southeast Asian collections as well as a concurrent show of Rajput paintings. Her exhibition, Pure Souls, The Jain Path to Perfection, displayed Jain manuscript pages and related sculptures in an installation designed to pretend, present their material, visual, and spiritual dimensions. In addition to Megacities Asia, she is working on a reinstallation of the MFA's Islamic collection upon its return to Boston in 2017. Thank you all for joining us today. Check out the exhibition as well as all of the incredible programs that we have surrounding it. And please now join me in welcoming today's speakers. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to hear. Um, to hear me and my co-curator, Al, talk about the exhibition today. Have some of you already seen the show? Yeah, it looks like about half, okay, great. So it'll be a very different experience, I think, those of you who have seen it and those of you who are perhaps anticipating. Um, but I hope, you, I hope you enjoy the presentation we're gonna give today. I'll let you know that I'm gonna give a brief introduction and then Al will be speaking about the works of art that are located in the, in the Gund Gallery and then I'm gonna come back at the end to talk about some of the works of art that are outside the Gund Gallery around the museum and downtown. So I'll just begin by talking a little bit about how the idea for this exhibition came to be. Um, it, it started out in conversations between Al and myself talking about some artists who we both, you know, who we share an interest in. 
and um, lo looking at what kind of work do they make and, and what are their strategies. And then we started to notice that we were able to find other artists. We, we started with some artists working in India, in Delhi and Bombay. And then we noticed that some artists in other major cities in Asia were working in a similar vein. And that's how the, the germ of the idea came about, to look at artists in cities across Asia. When I think, um, when many of us think about Asian cities, we, we bring to mind images that look sort of like the ones I have on the screen here today. Maybe you all have different images based on having traveled there. I think that is something that, that can change the mental image. But through the media, through the internet, we often get images of, of crowds, of amazing high rises, of crowded workplaces, streets full of traffic. Um, and maybe you see in the center here this juxtaposition of, of rural ways of life with a highly built up urban landscape. These, these are the kinds of things that, that Al and I were thinking are sort of circulating throughout society. But artistic perspectives on these cities we thought might offer a different view of what what these cities are like. And, and so the idea really was, what, let's look at what they have to say about cities in Asia, and what do they have to say about the human experience, not necessarily the, the, the traffic or the, or the architecture or the infrastructure, but the human experience of what is it like to be in these places. This is another image that, the kind that I think we often see in the media, um, it's a, it's a great image, but it's one that gives us a very limited sense of what the cities are like. It tells you about their populations and gives a, you a sense of the size of Asia's cities. But it doesn't really tell you as much as it might or as other things can about human beings. So when we look at Asian urbanization in general, we can put it in the context of global urbanization since um, if, if we look starting at, say, 1950, um, the whole world has been becoming more and more urbanized since then, over the last 60 some odd years. But when you look at Asia in particular, what you notice is that um, it has been urbanizing faster than any other part of the world in this last period, in, in this half century. One of the most clear manifestations of the great speed and scale at which Asia is urbanizing is the emergence of megacities, cities of 10 million people and more. So what you see in this chart here is from 19, in 1975, there was just one, Tokyo. Tokyo, I think, was already a megacity in 1950. Um, by 2000, all of a sudden, you have nine. In 2010, you have 12 megacities in Asia. And um, in 2014, the UN counted 16. And I should say, at that point, six, there were 28 megacities in the world in general. So with 16 of them just in Asia, you have more than half of the world's largest cities located in Asia. So we began to focus on megacities in particular to, as places where you could think about this very rapid urbanization and, and where it's concentrated. Megacities are indeed places where there's a great concentration of not only people, but... Um, but also different kinds of power, political power. They're often the administrative centers of their countries. Economic power, megacities tend to generate a disproportionate amount of, of the GDP of, of their country. They're very, very productive. Cultural power and educational, institutional power in that sense, they're often the home to in important educational institutions, universities, museums, think tanks. So in, in a lot of different ways, these these cities are kind of uh, focuses for, uh, or focal points for, for the nation in general, where a lot of different forces in society are intersecting and, and becoming very powerful in a small place, in a small space. So these are the five cities that we ended up deciding to focus on. Two in India, two in China, and one in Korea. And what you see here is a diagram that was generated by Northeastern University. We did a great partnership with Northeastern with their data visualization department, and they made this graphic for us. You see this on a huge wall right outside of Gund when you exit the exhibition. 
So what you see here is the population of these cities, starting down in the bottom left corner, you have 1950 or 1960. Can anybody see what date that is? <laughs> Even I can't. I think it's 1960. But so starting down here, you see our, the five colors. These are our cities. And in gray, we have Boston's starting point. Already by then, you have Tokyo is way up here. And by the way, this dotted line shows you the mega, what we're calling the mega city threshold. So that's the 10 million mark. So already at that point, Tokyo and New York were over the threshold. But our cities rapidly became more than twice as large as the megacity requirement, over 20 million, really within an incredibly short period of time. We're looking at about 50 years. And, and so you, you, know, you see the growth in this intense curve. And it's interesting, I think, to look at it compared to the curve of Tokyo, which, which is totally a different shape. It, it, it developed earlier, but also over a longer stretch of time. And then if you look at these dotted lines at the end of each curve, these represent projections into the future. So this is today. Boston is 4.2 million. And I should say I'm talking about the greater metropolitan region, not the city proper. Um, we've got Delhi here at 25.7. But by 2030, it's anticipated that Delhi will be all the way up here, just under Tokyo, and that Tokyo at that point will already be coming down. So we have some changes ahead. But most strikingly, you just see that there is continued growth ahead. These cities have made an incredibly fast transition from being small, small sized cities to being megalopolises of the kind that have never been seen before in Asia or anywhere else around the globe. So to put it as clearly as I can, our question is, or the question that we had in our minds as we worked through the exhibition planning process was how does this rapid urbanization, this almost, you could call it mega urbanization or hyper urbanization, how does it impact culture, art, and objects, and the human experience? And how can we learn more about that through works of art? I want to say one last thing before we begin going into the exhibition itself, and that is that um, I, we want to give we, we hope that a multifaceted impression of the cities is conveyed through our presentation and as well as through the exhibition itself. It's, it's easy to think of these cities as places that are just really difficult, to think of them as facing great challenges, to think of them as places where poverty and pollution are at a, at a, a, a terrible scale. But I think it's important for us to, to be a little bit more open-minded, be as open-minded as we can, and think about that cultural and political power that we talked about, their productivity, and to think about them from as many angles as we can. And for that reason, I brought in this graphic, which is, um, it's a little bit difficult to make sense of, I think. But here, you see India and China. Here, we, it shows that in 2005, India was about 30% urbanized and China was just over 40. So you can compare that to the US. In the same year, it was about 80% urbanized. So you can see the difference in how much of the country has become urban. But mostly what I really want you to see is that, is that this line is going, all of these lines are going up, that as these countries are becoming more urbanized, their per capita GB, GDP is going up. People are becoming, I, I think sometimes we think, oh, you know, people are going into the cities and they're facing poverty and the challenges. It's important to remember that the reason that China, for example, has a goal of becoming 60% urbanized within the next few decades is because they want to improve the, the lives of, of the people who live there. They want the, the per capita GDP to be higher. They want people to have more prosperity and wealth. So with that... Um, with that uh, suggestion that we all try to think in as um, complex and open-minded a way about these cities as we can, I will turn the microphone over to Al. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Laura, for that intro to the exhibition concept. So clearly, we had decided on our five cities after a long period of exploration and research so then we had to go to them, which is really the most fun part, I think, of 
all curatorial processes. Um, here you see just a few snaps of Laura and I's experiences in Asia, from visiting artist studios in cities like Delhi, um, visiting museums, that's the middle top. Um, Laura was very pregnant when we went to Korea, so it's been fun for the artist in the exhibition to re-meet her daughter from uh, and her bud stage to her fully formed self. Um, and of course we met um, artists like Ai Weiwei, who you see at the bottom with me and one of his many, many cats. So we were told over and over again during our travels and learned throughout our research that these issues of urbanization, whether they be about economic growth or overcrowding or pollution, have had a tremendous impact on what artists are thinking about in all of these cities. It infiltrates lots of different practices, whether they be painters, photographers, video artists, people we met kept bringing up these themes. And it's also interesting, I think, to point out that we don't just meet artists when we travel. We sought out urban planners, architects, curators, professors, thinkers, critics, to get a more holistic sense of what was going on. But one thing that Laura and I had been interested in from the very beginning of the process and was sort of reiterated to us over and over again was that there was one particular way of art making that was common to all of these cities and that we think is particularly compelling um, to conveying these ideas to viewers. And that's the use of found objects. In this exhibition, the city is both the subject in a way, but it's also the material that the city provides. And they're not, you know, these aren't people sculpting things out of marble or bronze and things. These are people looking to their environments and plucking out materials sometimes unchanged. Um, you could look at an Eastern precedent, maybe the best is the scholar's rock, the idea that somebody sees something that exists in nature and notices its potential for creativity and for artistry and changes its environment. Um, but of course, the more recent precedent and one of the most important precedents of art making in general today is Duchamp's you know, quote unquote, invention of the ready-made. The idea that you could take a urinal or a bike wheel or a stool, a sculpture ready-made by manufacturing or its mere existence, and change its context and its story to make it into a work of art. Um, in the background, you see Rush Hour in Beijing, just like the Mass Pike, but a little worse. Um, so next time you complain, think of this picture. Um, but the artists in this exhibition aren't just taking one object or two. In a city of 25 million people, the amount of materials being provided is tremendous. It's exponential growth in accordance to the city itself. So all the works you see in the exhibition are accumulations of things. There's also um, an interactivity or a physical aspect to the works in the exhibition. There are pieces that you get inside of, you go upstairs, that you touch, um, that make you feel your body in specific ways that relates to the way the mega city impacts the body of someone living or visiting there. There are times in these huge cities where you feel really big, even me, that I, you know, you're going down a crowded street in Mumbai and you can barely move, that there's very little space to occupy. But at the same time, when you leave the horizontal city, the street level city, and you go into the vertical city, for instance, at the top of a new multi-million dollar skyscraper, you get very little. We become just an ant and an epic, sprawling agglomeration of urbanism that exists in a large way in these cities. So as Laura mentioned, the exhibition um, is really unprecedented for this institution. It's the largest show of contemporary art the MFA has ever mounted, and it's also different in, I think, one particularly special way. It exists in the Gund Gallery, which is our largest space for special exhibitions here, but it also exists throughout the building. There are seven satellite locations for this show, so it's really encouraging our visitors to look um, throughout the building and to explore other things along the way. But I'm gonna start with the objects in Gund. Um, hopefully in an order that makes sense, but it's not really necessary. This isn't a show that follows a chronology. It's not a show that leads you on a linear path. We want to reward exploration. Um, Hemo Padie was an artist um, who lived in Mumbai whose experiences as a migrant dramatically impacted the art that she made. This is Darvi. If you ever saw the movie Slumdog Millionaire, it might look a little familiar. Darvi is one of the largest informal settlements in Asia and in India. This is the center of Mumbai, is occupied by this slum, essentially, of more than a million residents. And it has been a place of tremendous um, creativity and inspiration for this artist. Darvi is a place with two lives. The Darvi on the left is the Darvi that the media probably tells you about more frequently. Um, sanitation is is a crisis there, particularly clean water. Space is very limited. That's sort of a typical residential street in Darvi at the bottom. 
helps to go on a diet before you visit Mumbai. And on the right, you see the other side of Darvi, which is a place of tremendous industry and ingenuity, the recycling business. So this is informal economy. The recycling business there is huge. People are sourcing materials from the trash, separating it out by color, melting it or breaking it down into pellets that can be sold and used to make new plastic products. It's an incredibly ingenious system that produces a lot of materials, but also a lot of wealth, surprisingly. It's also a place, Mumbai in general, and on the outskirts of Darvi, where you see a lot of juxtaposition. For at one point, you have in the heart of the city these very low buildings, these short buildings made of car scraps and aluminum and just stuff that's available. And in the same sweeping view, you see Mumbai's newest, tallest, often wealthiest high-rise living conditions. This is Hema Upadhyay's piece called 8 by 12, and that's how big it is. It's 8 by 12 feet, which is the average size of a family dwelling in Dharavi. So entering this piece, which you're supposed to do, and like this guy, you can take pictures. That's sort of what I see every day in there the most, and I think that's great. Um, and feel the constriction of living in a place like Dharavi or a place like Mumbai, where you really are penned in um, to a small area. But at the same time, the artist is evoking a sweeping view of the entire city and its undulating and often changing landscape, where very tall buildings and these low-lying buildings are constantly going up, so there's constant motion and color. And this piece is also made by the kind of materials that Darvi residents might use to create dwellings. Again, corrugated aluminum, there's a car bumper in there, all loosely evoking um, one city at the same time in this dizzying view. Um, this is an image of Hema from our studio visit with her um, in her Mumbai studio, um, working on a previous piece that would be the sort of seed of inspiration for another work in our exhibition. These are little clay birds um, made by Kolkata craftsmen out of unfired river clay and sold fairly cheaply as kids' toys. Um, but what Hema does is she paints them all and carves them to look like migratory species, and they represent her own migration. So people who come into Mumbai and a lot of megacities, that's why the population grows. It's not like people are having 15 kids. It's really um, a lot of factors, but migration is a big one. The moving from smaller towns or rural areas into the city is a major contributor. And when people come, they have lots of hopes and dreams and goals that may or may not be realized. You know, Hema brought this back to even her family's migration from what is now Pakistan into India during partition in 1947, and her own migration from a smaller city to Mumbai to become an artist and start a career, and how jarring that experience was. Um, here you see um, one of our helpers unpacking the 300 birds that would form the commissioned project Hema did for us um, in the galleries. And here is one of our conservators, Flavia Perugini, cataloging all. There were actually 316 birds because she smartly made backups, which we very much appreciate, um, to be arranged on a shelf. Um, our staff had to put these things together in a very specific way. We glue these little quotes into their mouths, and these are quotations that the artist would take from literature, for instance, about the sort of hopes, dreams, and experiences of migrants. Um, and they were also tied with monofilament, every bird to its stand and every bird in stand to the shelf. So it's a very delicate and time-consuming process in order to create this, the 35-foot shelf that presents 300 of these hand-carved and painted birds. It's not a happy story, but it's one we have to mention. The artist was murdered in December of last year. Um, a lot of difficult decisions had to be made, but our staff went, I think, to incredible lengths to create this piece and make her vision come into reality. Subud Gupta is one of the best known artists in the exhibition, also from India. We purposely sought out artists who were early in their careers, as well as mid-career and internationally acclaimed. Um, Sabode's work is inspired a lot by food and the role food plays in Indian life. Here you see Sabode cooking for us twice. Uh, serving food to Laura and I in his studio in Delhi, and then in Laura's kitchen in Brookline a couple of weeks ago, making us traditional curry. Eat food, the man loves food, and it's fantastic for people who know him. Um, he sources the materials for his sculptures at places like this on the left. This is just a market in Delhi where you buy stainless steel utensils and dishes and plates that any family would own. I mean, this is common stuff that you would have in a house regardless of your class. And at the bottom you see the sort of ritualistic cooking of the Hindu household. It's not just a place where you would make food to feed your family, but it's a place where you would make food as offerings to the gods. 
Here's our staff installing the piece by Sabote in the exhibition, which is called Take Off Your Shoes and Wash Your Hands, which is what his mother would have told him um, in Bihar, the more rural area where he grew up before moving to Delhi, um, when he would come inside for a meal. This is the piece as it's installed downstairs. These are simple dish drying and storage racks that any Indian family would have in their home. The plates are just put in there. They're not secured, so don't take one. Um, just leave them where they are. We hope everyone goes along with that plan. Um, but if you were to interpret, say, each dish rack as a family, but you would put it in the context of Delhi with 25.7 million people, how does community happen? How many families are there? How does population density affect life? How do you bring ritual from a smaller town or a rural area like he did into the environment of a large city? And how does the presence, or in this case, the absence of food, have an impact on urban life? Aditi Joshi is the youngest artist in the exhibition, hailing from Mumbai, and her work comes from another strategy based on her city and her materials. In 2005, a particular incident really sparked a working strategy for this artist. There was an awful flood. Um, it was in a whole region of the country. More rain fell in one day than usually falls in a year, and there's always a rainy season, so that's saying a lot. Um, and in Mumbai, it was particularly devastating. Hundreds of people died. This is an, a news image from that day, as people had to abandon in cars and commute home as best they could. And this is what sort of the aftermath of the flood is like. There is always a tremendous amount of plastic, and in particular plastic bags, in Mumbai. You just see it everywhere. You can't avoid it. Again, this is a culture where slums and high-rises coexist, where you see everything in one place. Um, the top image is what happens when, say, there's a flood, and the aged draining systems of a growing city can't keep up with the amount of plastic that's being rushed down the gutters. And that's what exacerbated the drama of that flood. For Aditi, this provided her two things. One, the use of plastic as a way to comment on the devastation that material can have on a city, but also a way of looking at plastic differently. You see it all the time, but is there the potential for beauty in this material? It's part of our lives. It's part of our environment. How can it be changed from one thing to another? She shipped us tons and tons of these bags, which she paints in her studio and actually uses the heat from a candle to make hard and crunchy. And on site, we created this armature per her specifications, and she, with a team of eight assistants, some from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, began constructing this piece made of those very plastic bags. Here you see her in front of the final piece in the Gund Gallery, which really is incredibly beautiful, quite a shocking outcome for material and an inspiration that came from tragedy. Hansa Kuhn is another one of the younger artists in the exhibition, hailing from Seoul, and he speaks to a little bit of the same issue, which is what happens to society um, as cities grow, and what is the role of plastic in that story? He would tell you a story that when his parents were kids or young adults living in Seoul, a popular recreational activity would be hiking, picnicking in a park. At the top, you actually see Seoul's Olympic Park on the outskirts of the city. But that, for people of a different generation, for instance, his son's generation, they'd say, Mom, Dad, I'm bored. Let's go to the supermarket, the magical playground of plastic. Um, so he sources green-colored plastic materials to create site-specific um, installations that evoke a changing landscape. Um, he shipped us six crates of green plastic material that he's been collecting and reusing in installations for a long period of time in Seoul, but he also really wanted to include Boston, our own city, in the story he was telling. Um, so with a budget, a couple of cars, and a lot of activity, we went to Alston to a stop and shop and a dollar store um, the week of St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and uh, see at the bottom Laura and her adorable daughter um, shopping with us in the dollar store. When these materials come to the MFA, um, what do we do with them? Well, our staff broke them into two long tables. We had the Seoul table and the Boston table. And to help the artists, we broke things down into categories like cleaning stuff, snacks, baby products. Um, I'm in the back wearing the St. Patrick's Day hat. I wore all day. Um, and then the artist begins the process of creating the work. Um, in advance, like several of the artists in the show, he did submit sketches or ideas, but it really doesn't give a sense in terms of they were very charming drawings, but we really didn't know what was going to happen. This magic sort of unfolded before our eyes as he began taking this material to create this final piece from a series called Supernatural. In the supermarket, you not only see green things because 
green is popular. Um, it's also a commentary on the way the marketing industry has taken hold of, for instance, Seoul's burgeoning green movement, a desire for organic products and healthy products, and subliminally used that color to try to lure us into often a false belief that what we're purchasing is healthy. And as the city loses green space more and more as building continues, what will the relationship be between people and the color green or people and these products? It's an interesting question to ask, but at the same time, it's clearly a sort of joyful and jubilant artwork. Another artist from Seoul is John Young Suk, who um, Jasmine mentioned will be giving a lecture here on May 11th. Um, he is the founder of an artist collective, so a rotating group of artists and individuals who make work together in Seoul in response to city changes. On the left and the right are two pictures of the same place. That's the Changachi stream, which is a stream that runs to the middle of Seoul, and way, way back in the past was the way material goods were brought on boats into the center of the city. And then they built the highway over it. These things happen. But not that long ago, in the early 2000s, it was decided that perhaps not unlike the High Line in New York, the Changacha could could become an issue of urban renewal or a place where a green park, a space that people so desperately desired for gathering in nature, um, could be resurrected. So the highway came down and this beautiful park was erected. It's a fantastic place. It's been very popular and successful. It's often toted as you know, a real crowning glory of global, you know, you know, ideas to make ecological spaces within large cities. Um, but at the bottom, you see one of the artist photographs of a very different part of that neighborhood, and that's a neighborhood of small-scale machine shops that exist just along the side of this stream, and which were threatened um, with dislocation at the time of this renovation project. Because the stream, as the stream opened and people started to flood in, a neighborhood's needs change. Um, and perhaps getting a vacuum cleaner or a toaster repaired was not so important to a gentrifying area. But the artists really believe that this is a kind of industry that's important. And that if you had broken the neighborhood up and sent them all to different areas in the city to start businesses, their network would collapse. One person is doing welding. Another person is casting metal. Without one shop, the next shop can't do their job. So working together with them, here you have him taking us and friend into this neighborhood. And this is one block away from that park and that stream, um, showing us and introducing us to the workers and talking about how he and his artists fellows rented a commercial space in that neighborhood, a storefront for six years, and took up residence to make artworks hand in hand with these machinists. And these are the works they created. There are four in the exhibition here, one made just for us, three that were existing, all that were in gig and move to represent the interconnectedness and also the resilience of this community. It's an installation shot down in Gund. Hu Xiang Cheng is a Shanghai-based artist, and I think of all these cities, if you think of a sort of icon of Asia's new urbanity, Shanghai is the one, right? We've all seen photos of Shanghai's incredible skyline across the Bund. It looks like something out of the Jetsons. It's really pretty. Um, but there are positive and negative sides to that in all of these cities, in Seoul as well as in Shanghai. This is an exhibition that the artist did outside of the Himalaya Center, which is a Shanghai sort of cultural center, but it also is the typical Asian I'll call it mega center. So there's a hotel, a condo complex, shopping, and an art museum all in one building. That is the new Asia. And this is a piece, um, essentially a maze, made of reclaimed doors. Doors from traditional Asian houses that get knocked down in demolition projects as China tries to build new cities and get sent to flea markets and places. And that's where the artist sources them. In this piece, he used the doors to make a maze that form a Chinese character, Chai, which is often put on construction sites. It means building. But it also sounds like China. So he's linking those two sort of now permanently interconnected forces. Um, he proposed a brand new piece for the MFA, um, which we built with him um, to our specifications. Here, the piece you see um, from downstairs in Gund, this is the artist's rendering, represents a different symbol. The inside is the Chinese character for wood, and that is the material that all these doors that he uses is made of. But when you put a box around it, that actually changes it to a different character that speaks more to confinement, or being trapped, or even confused. Are we trapped in our cities? Can we look any way without seeing a skyscraper? Are we trapped at this place where we can't go back 
We've knocked so much down and we've built so much up. Will urbanization just continue at this clip? Um, here you see the artists working on the installation, bringing together these doors and parts from various flea markets to make this, you know, a little maze for us. And it's something that interesting to point out that Laura and I have had the benefit of learning from Nancy Berliner, this museum's curator of Chinese art, a lot about the sort of historical and cultural precedences that the Chinese artists are working with today. If you see in the picture on the left, there's a sticker on this woman's door. Or in the picture on the right, you see things, posters, packaging, calendar sheets, torn out and glued up. That's a really common way that, say, a working class family in China for many, many, many decades have used to decorate their homes. And you also see it in the artwork, where the artist has chosen photos he's bought at flea markets, st kids' stickers, um, and adorn these old historic doors to represent that cultural aspect. You also see photographs in a video that represent Asia's megacities more generally. Bangkok is in there, Tokyo is in there, but the artist has mislabeled them. So for instance, you might see a picture of Tokyo and it's labeled Shanghai. Because to him, one of the big problems of urbanization in Asia is that all the cities start to look the same. Everyone wants glass, everyone wants concrete, everyone wants height. How do you lose the specificity of a region or a culture when you try to put, make everything with a star architect working in international methods? Yin Xiujun is an artist from Beijing who's also been influenced by the way that the Chinese government and the you know, move towards development has destroyed housing and other buildings of a different time period. But for her, they're not historic buildings. They're really buildings, say, from her youth. There are buildings from the 1970s that are being leveled because they're not new enough and they're not big enough and they're not representations of this growing culture and growing population. Um, Laura and I were part of a symposium recently that we did with Harvard University South Asia Initiative in conjunction with this exhibition. We learned from one of the scholars who spoke on the panel that China used more concrete in a three-year period, a recent three-year period, than the US did in the entire 20th century. Pretty staggering statistic. So the artist Yin Xu Zhen goes to places, demolition sites, and takes rubble from the buildings that have been destroyed. And into them, she inserts pieces of used clothing given to her by residents, or by friends, or by her own family. Because for her, the way clothing absorbs sweat is also the same way that clothing or a building absorbs spirits. That even if you knock this building down, all the things that happen there, the lives of the families that live there, are still existing, not only in that place, but in those materials. And that's why those materials inspire her. They become like grass growing through the cracks, even though they're knocked down for a different way of life. Here you see her in the gun gallery arranging this really beautiful and quiet piece amidst some of the other cacophony of the space, and this is the final artwork. Asim Waqif was trained as an architect and practiced for a brief time in Delhi and very quickly got bored because he wanted to use his hands. But he also had something to say about this march towards progress and these building methods that we've adopted. If you want to live someplace and feel like you're now, if you're in India, which has fought years and years of being misrepresented by the international media as a place of poverty or backwardness, you're like, I want to live in a new house. I want stainless steel and big glass walls and concrete. I don't want the old materials that were used to make things here for centuries. And one of the materials is bamboo. Bamboo makes sense in India. It's abundant, so it's cheap. It's extremely resilient. It can take wind load. It can move a lot. And it's cool in the summer. Think of how hot it is in India even in the winter. Bamboo keeps things cool. But today, you really see bamboo in a very limited use primarily for scaffolding on new shiny buildings, um, but even the artist brings up the point that it's used in crematoria to move bodies around. This is a poor man's material that's seen as outmoded and a part of India's past. But to Asim Waqif, bamboo is not something that needs to be discarded in the march towards progress. Couldn't you wed new technology in bamboo to make a sustainable future in India and beyond. So he makes these structures by inserting bespoke electronic systems into bamboo itself, and those artworks respond to us, to light, to touch, to the pressure of your feet when you walk inside of it with these mechanical noises that are made through mechanical systems but also sound a little bit like crickets. So he's bringing together the new and the old, the technological and the vernacular um, to tell a different story. Here you see our conservators painstakingly cleaning a whole bunch of old bamboo, um, and the artist assembling the piece. This is actually how the work called Venu, which means, um, which simply means bamboo in Hindi or Sanskrit, looked at its last exhibition. Every time he takes it all apart and starts from scratch and makes something specific to the environment. So that is it being shown in Paris, and this is it here at the MFA today. So a very different experience for our audiences. 
I'm going to invite Laura back up to talk about some really exciting aspects of the exhibition as they fill through the building. If you'll forgive me, Al, I just, I just want to say, I don't know if you, if you told them about how they can touch. Did you say it? That you're, that you're allowed to interact and touch, and it's really through your participation that all of these, this particular object comes to life. And I, I just wanted to make sure everyone understood that, because it's hard. Everyone is used to going through museums and not um, you know, being very careful to protect and stay clear of the objects, but this is an exhibition where many of them allow you to touch, and this is one where um, unless you spend some real time in there banging on things and um, covering the hole at the end of the bamboo with your hand for a minute or watching where your shadow falls, only then will you start to get it to make strange sounds and it sort of starts to talk to you. But, okay, now outside of Gund, we have, as Al said, many other objects that also are part of the exhibition. Some of them are inside the building in various parts of the public spaces, other galleries, um, and, some of, and then we have one piece outside, which I will talk about, and one down, downtown. The first one that I wanted to discuss is, is by the artist Ai Weiwei, who has already come up a bit today, and it's his piece Forever, which is installed in the Shapiro family courtyard. It's a piece that is inspired by the bicycle. He uses bicycles that are made um, in China by a company called Shanghai Forever. Um, and he's inspired by the bicycle because the bicycle is something that, especially in Beijing, has been ubiquitous f for many, many years. And certainly in the period when I was gr when Ai Weiwei was growing up, it was something he would see absolutely everywhere. In the 1980s, according to one measure, 76%, so more than three quarters of, the, of road space in Beijing was taken up by bicycles. Three quarters. So in that period, they were the most common means of transport. And as far as I know, that was true even in the early 90s. Bicycles were the most common means of getting around in the city as well as in rural areas. And a, a bicycle was an important family asset. It was something that you, uh, a family saved up to buy. It was something that it was important to be able to give to your children as they got older. It, it's an important part, an important status symbol as well. Um, and, and so China manufactures bicycles as well as using them. Today, manu China manufactures about 60% of the world's bicycles. But today, most of those are for export. Bicycles are still part of life in Beijing as well as outside. They're still the primary way that people, uh, that the poor get around. And it's, they're still used in, in Beijing itself. Today there are bicycle lanes and some roads in Beijing, as you can see on the in the bottom two pictures here. But it's hard to bike in Beijing today. Some roads ban bikes entirely. And then even when you do have bicycle lanes, sometimes they they are not safe, or they're, um, they're occupied by cars anyway. Um, so you have, it's harder to ride bicycles in the city today. People now also aspire not to own a bicycle, but to own a car. And that's something that has happened naturally as the country has become more prosperous and more urban, but it's also something that's been intentional, that the Chinese government has um, promoted car buying sort of it makes me think of the way home buying is something that is that was sort of promoted in in the U.S. Um, but but so you know car buying is a way that has kept factories going in in China and has kept consumer spending up and so it's it's been something that has been promoted by the government and so you have an incredible increase in the number of cars from from 1990 to 2000 for example the number of cars in China grew 450 percent. In Beijing today, there are about six and a half million cars, and um, it was just one million only. Um, actually, I don't know exactly how long ago, 10 or 20 years, I'm not sure. And today, there are so many cars that Beijing, the city government is actually trying to limit the number of new license plates that are given out um, in order to deal with congestion, but also pollution. So here is um, just an image of the, of the company that produces these bicycles, Shanghai Forever. 
Ai Weiwei takes these bicycles and he's used them to make a whole series of artworks, um, sometimes using, I believe, in Toronto, which is the lower right, he used about 3,000 bicycles. Sometimes they take the form of these great towers that, to me, um, put in my mind sort of the, the towering skyscrapers that you see in pictures like this one. But, some, but, but they take many different forms, and the piece that he erected here at the MFA, or that we erected, was a pre-existing piece that we borrowed for this show, and it, it's made up of 64 bicycles. And here you can see our staff putting it together. And this is the completed piece. The bicycles, in this case, form a circular structure. You can see that best from, from this photo where you're looking from above. And we, Al and I have, have talked about this piece as being something that, um, if you think of the bicycle as being a symbol of how fast China, and Beijing in particular, has changed, and how it has become really transformed, very unlike what it was when this artist was young, um, you can also see in the circular formation of this sculpture a, a question about, about what is unchanging. The circle can become kind of a symbol for the eternal. And so one way of putting the question is perhaps to say, what is there that is eternal in a city that changes so fast? Is there still something that can be maintained? Another piece that we have included by Ai Weiwei is right outside Remus Auditorium. So you will all have just walked underneath it, and I'm sure you noticed it. It's a piece that he made after the 2008, um, a, a terrible earthquake in May of 2008 in Sichuan province in China. So this wasn't an event within a city, but it's one that drew Ai Weiwei out of the city to go investigate because um, at, during the earthquake, many, many buildings collapsed, including schools, and that's what you see in the upper left here is the image of a, of a middle school that just completely collapsed during the earthquake. And what he saw, he went out there partly because the Chinese government did not want to release the number of deaths, um, and in general did not want media to be reporting on this incident, and, and the artist felt that it couldn't be forgotten, it couldn't be allowed to be suppressed. So he went there, and one thing he mentions observing is what you see down here in the right, which is um, this awful, awful thing to see, but the, the items that he saw strewn across the landscape at the site of these building collapses, backpacks, pencils, notebooks. So as a way to commemorate this event, he created a sculpture called snake ceiling, and here you can see it's, um, the materials that form the snake being unpacked on these large tables and then hung from the ceiling. These are all backpacks. They, they, they resemble ch the backpacks that he saw at the site, children's backpacks, and he has connected them together, about 350 of them. It, um, it, it sometimes, you could say that it suggests a long line of children maybe um, waiting to go outside for recess or to come into the school. It evokes that that, um, that all of the students, and it does that also by um, embroidery on the backpacks. Each one has the date of the earthquake. And this is something, I mean, it's a powerful piece, but it's one that we also see as linked to the exhibition and the themes of the exhibition, not only because he's using everyday objects, but also because this issue of um, building collapses is something that is linked very much to the speedy urbanization that we see in cities like Shanghai and Mumbai. When, um, the, so much money is going into construction and so many buildings are needed so fast, um, it's not always possible to make buildings strong and secure and completely stable. And sometimes, um, and, and there have been tragedies all across China that are attributed to shoddy building that is a result of sort of hyper urbanization and, and the rushing and perhaps in, in, in some cases also the corruption that can come when such so much massive amounts of money are flowing into the hands of developers and construction companies. Songdong is one of the um, is also one of the more senior artists that we included in the exhibition. He lives in Beijing as well. And he's someone whose work, oh, so I should tell you where his piece is. His piece is actually on the second floor of the museum in the Chinese Sculpture Gallery, and I'll show you an image in a moment. Song Dong is someone who makes his sculptures out of salvaged elements from Hutong, or Sehuan, buildings in, in Beijing, and I'll talk about those in a minute. So his work is, in a, in a way, it relates to 
the sculpture by Hu Shang Cheng that Al showed you a few moments ago. He's taking discarded architectural pieces and giving them new life. But he's drawing in particular on a kind of building type that's specific to Beijing, and it's a type that he experienced as a child. Hutong are neighborhoods that date to about the 15th century. They began to be constructed around the 15th century. And basically what these are are courtyard homes, so buildings, small buildings erected around a courtyard, and the homes become linked together, or you can build them side by side, so you end up having kind of a long chain of these courtyard homes. And that creates what they call a hutong. Um, and then between these long strips of linked courtyard homes, you have these very, very narrow lanes. And so that's what you see here. Kind of each one of these is a home. Well, this is a, this is a model, but you know, maybe one of those is a home, and one of, this is another one. Each one has a courtyard at the center, and then narrow lanes between them. Th this is a, a, a form of housing that has been identified as, as being, it has several kind of unique and important features. And one of those is that the, the families live very close together. Sometimes courtyards are shared. Those narrow lanes are, are they, they allow people to constantly be crossing each other's paths. And so they're seen as sort of promoting social interaction, promoting community. They also have ecological advantages because you have those long narrow lanes that are uninterrupted in the hot weather they can become kind of channels for cool breezes and in the cold weather they they um, can kind of preserve or trap heat they're also they also have very advanced systems for water collection water catchment that are threaded throughout the structures throughout the through arc, throughout the architecture so this is something that it, um, has been in Beijing for a long time and Song Dong himself grew up in a neighborhood like this, but he grew up in a period when the, the hutongs were already beginning to be in disrepair. Many of them had been subdivided, and so instead of just having one family living in a courtyard house, you suddenly now had several families sharing them, um, and then also making additions when they needed to. So the, you, the sort of purity of that architectural form hasn't been maintained. And it, he was growing up in a period when people were adding on as they, as they needed to because their families were growing, but the spaces were not. Following, um, and, and then in the last 50 to 75 years, you've seen not just the kind of disrepair of these hutongs, but also just them being completely torn down to make way for new development. And it's believed, I think, that 70%, 70 percent of the hutongs of Beijing have been destroyed as of today. So I just wanted to show you some examples. Um, here's a hutong that is now a fancy restaurant. Um, here's one that's become revitalized and is now a shopping street with all sorts of boutiques. And here's a plan for a hutong skyscraper where they're trying to take those, those social advantages of community and interaction and environmental um, efficiency and, and build those into a skyscraper, acknowledging the fact that that um, density and verticality are now necessary. We installed this sculpture um, with the artist present. Um, it's the first time it's been shown outside of China, so it was a, a very interesting to bring it over here and ha see our, our staff kind of work together with him to figure out how to get it all to fit together. It has this massive iron frame or steel frame, um, and then it has lots of panels that, that fit together, all taken from um, previous buildings. But not everything fit together the, exactly the way we thought it would, and, and our staff isn't really used to kind of just banging on things to make them fit, but that was, that was sometimes necessary. And so what he, what he created in this piece is sort of a two-story home. He uses the gray tiles that you see everywhere in the hutongs and reclaimed architectural elements, but he used them to create um, a house, a kind of compact living structure that suggests the way that the hutongs had to be um, kind of inventively remodeled as families, as, as space and money necessarily, didn't necessarily increase in the, the, the period when he was growing up. But families' needs increased. And so in some cases you had families who had a, a homing pigeon coop on the roof that is what this shape is meant to evoke, and they would slowly turn that into an extra bedroom. So first it would maybe become a storage space, and then suddenly there's a bed there, and so it becomes an extra bedroom, and it, it's an it's a inventive way of creating more living space. So you can walk 
up these stairs and actually enter the room up there and tucked behind a shelving unit is a little bed. You can also enter the bottom, which is a sort of whole apartment unto itself. It's a little bit treacherous, so this is, um, you're only gonna be able to enter on certain nights, Wednesday and, Wednesdays and Saturdays, we think, but we, I hope that you all get a chance to, to go inside and experience this, this home. He calls this series Wisdom of the Poor because I think he has a great deal of respect for the, um, the ingenious ways that people made use of what they had in the, in the period um, when he was growing up in the 60s and 70s. We have a number of works in the exhibition by Che Zhenghua from Seoul. He's probably our most senior artist from Seoul. Um, and he, we had a wonderful visit with him in the city when he took us to the market that's nearby his studio. And I, I, I hope I'm getting the name right, Dong Daemun Market. It's a hundred year old marketplace in Korea. And it's, it, I think one of the things that's interesting about Seoul is that the marketplaces there, the street markets are really, really bustling and vital. And so it's, it, Seoul is a, a very, very modern city um, and feels in many ways very Western. It has mega malls and Al and I really enjoyed in our travels going to the mega malls and, and just kind of pigging out in the amazing food courts, the so luxurious and, and just watching the incredible displays of fashion and, and luxury lifestyle. But there are also these other kind of much more local merchant, you know, um, social spaces, these street markets that are just really thriving today. So here are some images of us eating at one. People go there to eat and they sit around these small booths where people are producing fresh food. These are spaces that Cha zheng likes to visit all the time. He, he likes to walk through the markets and he knows a lot of the people who are selling in the markets near him. And he draws inspiration from the the things he sees there, but also from an idea that he holds very deeply, which is that all of these people are makers. They're all artists of a kind, whether they're making um, food or they're making some kind of object to sell, some sort of permanent object, a houseware or a machine. He sees these all as artists, and so he likes to say everyone is an artist and everything is art. He draws inspiration from the stacking, the way that objects are arranged in these markets. So here you can see just I think these are textiles, or maybe paper. I'm not quite sure, but these are the kinds of things you see in these markets, and, and they're just sort of incredibly overabundant and colorful and bright, and, um, and, and just stacked sometimes in very ingenious ways. So we visited Che Zhenghua, we went to his studio, which has a terrace where you're looking down at an industrial site, and I feel like between the market and the industrial sites around him, these are things that are clearly kind of images and objects that are entering his mind. And in particular, there was one object that he brought home from a market that we saw in his studio. It's this stool, stool here, and he, he mentioned that it was just a plain plastic stool, but he saw it in a market, and someone had tied this white styrofoam to the seat with a piece of rope. And that way they just kind of warmed their bum. You know, it wasn't quite as cold to sit there if you had the styrofoam under you. And that was, an, he said, that, this is my teacher. So he, he, he sees something profound in the way that someone has transformed this stool to make it, um, to make it their own. So for this, uh, this piece, which I'm showing you just a, a drawing that the artist made as he was creating it, um, this was a site-specific commission that he did. So he came and visited last year and he chose this site for a new iteration of his series called Alchemy. And this is a piece that is made out of the types of objects you would see in those markets. It's made out of plastic dishes, bowls, cups, candy dishes, plates, all different types of sort of everyday plastic wares. He decided in this case to put them in this beautiful second story part of the museum in the Evans Wing where we have a hemicycle, a half circle of um, ionic columns, and then above them is a half dome. And it's really the old architecture, the late 19th century architecture that we have here, already has certain layers of meaning in it. And if you think back to kind of the origins of spaces like this, if you think about the Pantheon in Rome, you have spaces like this where the pillars um, seem to be almost reaching up from the earthly realm, reaching up into the heavens, which are represented by the dome. And he liked that those layers of symbolism that were already present in his, 
in this space. And so he decided to add to it by putting pillars of plastic cups and bowls in between. You can see us unpacking the pillars. The, pillar, the cups and bowls are threaded onto a rod with LED lights placed in them every so often, so the pillars can be lit from within. And then they were made to just about exactly the right height between our pillars, and so we installed them one by one and created this beautiful ring of nine glowing pillars. And the way I think, it, it's called alchemy, and I think the way, I, the way he talks about it is that, um, that there's a kind of alchemy even in that plastic stool, turning a plastic stool into something, transforming it into something different. Um, here he transforms plastic into something that seems like jewels, like colored glass, something very, very precious. And the fact that it's in this space that's kind of reaching up towards what you might think of as the heavens or God shows even further how he's, transform he's, he, he's thinking of it as something that's transformative for human beings who have aspirations, um, but also um, for the material itself to be transformed into something that's capable of linking heaven and earth. So he, he sees a tremendous amount of potential in plastic. It's a, it reminds you maybe of the plastic piece uh, of green, the, the green mountain of, from Seoul also, but he has a very different take on this, on this material. He also did a piece called Chaosmos Mandala, which uh, was done in a different form um, in 2014, but he, he kind of completely redid it when he came to our gallery. This is a gallery in the Asian wing. It's... Um, it right immediately next to the gallery that holds traditional Korean art. And it's often, this space is often used to, to show paintings, but here he covered all of the walls and the floor eventually with silver mirrored mylar. And then he, he brought a, he, we, we shipped here this massive silver disc from which three tiers of chandeliers were hung. These are chandeliers. <laughs> He's, he's an amazing guy. He's, he's really, I like to say he's like a rock star crossed with a Buddhist monk. Because um, he really does talk about transformation and uh, the universe, the cosmos, in very profound ways. But he, he got these chandelier pieces at one of these local markets. He told me they cost him $1, $2. And in fact, he got many of them broken. They were broken when he bought them. When we unpacked them here, our conservators started to freak out, you know, thinking that they had been damaged on the way, but no, no, he just, he likes them that way. So he takes these, again, just very mundane objects, these chandeliers, and turns them into a glittering, um, a, a massive glittering chandelier. And the way he described it to me is that the chandelier um, rotates a little bit, it, it actually sways more, and it kind of alludes to the heavens again, sort of like the sparkling sky that that wrote the, the stars in the sky that rotate. And the floor here becomes kind of the earthly zone, in, although in this case he describes it as a sea, a seascape, because it's reflective, it reflects the stars above. But really reflection is the thing that happens in here. So you see yourself reflected, the chandeliers reflected in the walls, everything, it becomes a crazy kind of hall of mirrors. And he increases that by putting this chair into the installation. So the chair is part of the work of art. And what he wants is for all of us to take turns sitting in the chair, having our friend take a picture and putting it on the web. <laughs> so, I mean, and I just think this, at first you might sort of think that this is just a means of, of ingenious promotion, self-promotion, but it fits in quite well with his idea that if you think of this as become, being almost like a three-dimensional map of the cosmos with the heavens and the sea, the earthly sphere, and all, everything reflecting everything else. So it suggests the infiniteness of that, that cosmos. Well, then he says, you are part of that too. And if you sit there and you get your picture taken and that picture goes out into the world and, is, uh, and appears on millions of other people's computers around the world, you're just becoming part of this infinity that you're already part of. But that, this is a way of... Uh, of expressing it and making it literal through, through the artwork and through your own reflection, your own image of that artwork. Um, we also have a, a flower on the front lawn. Have you seen it? Yeah. 
It's coming up and down because of the weather going up and down right now. But it's, a, it's, a, it's called Breathing Flower, and it's inspired in some, uh, to some degree by markets like this that you see in Seoul, where they specifically um, sell a million different varieties of plastic flowers. I, I don't know if you will all agree with me, but I, I, when I was growing up, plastic flowers were something that we um, kind of turned up our nose at. You had real flowers were what you really wanted. Um, but this artist says, well, actually, in some ways, aren't plastic flowers more amazing, more alive than a real flower? A real flower will fade and die, and you throw it away. But plastic flowers are not disposable. Plastic flowers never fade. They have this incredible vitality that you overlook sometimes. So again, he's seeing something really important and powerful in, in an everyday object. So he... <laughs> Here's here images of us inflating the flower. And one, uh, one other, so I mean, partly this work is about that, that those everyday objects and that, and that power he sees in them, but it's also about the natural world. And in this way, it links up very much with um, actually both of the other Korean soul-based artists that Al spoke about. Um, it's also about, the, about nature in the city. And one thing that um, Han Seok Hyun mentioned when he t the, the artist who made the Green Mountain, is that, is that in, in Seoul, after the Korean War, everything was destroyed. Even the forests in the ring of mountains that surround Seoul were destroyed. So he says, even the forests have been remade by human beings in the last 65 years. Even the forests are man-made. The parks in the city are man-made. The Cheonggaecheong stream that Al talked about, you know, it's this ancient stream, but the park around it, even, you know, the whole thing has been modified by human beings so many times. So all of these artists, in a way, are asking us to think about nature, what, what role nature plays, and what kinds of experiences we can have with nature in a city as highly developed and as dense as Seoul. So here, with the flower on our front lawn, for me, it makes me think about how actually the flower is not the only artificial thing on the front lawn. The grass and the trees are also something that were made by all of us, by, made by, by uh, human beings as we crafted that natural environment or our idea of what the natural environment should be like. And the final piece by Che Zhenghua is also the final, is the one work of art that's not on the MFA's campus. Um, this is an image of a previous installation of, of a work called Fruit Tree. And this will be installed, if the weather cooperates, on Friday. Um, and it will be placed right at the end of Quincy Market, at the eastern end of Quincy Market, opposite Faneuil Hall. I think in many ways, the, this piece, you, you, having seen these other works by Che Zhenghua, you, you have the tools to already begin to interpret it. Um, so there's not that much to add. I, I think um, maybe one thing to mention is that, that this, is a, this is a piece that really makes him very happy because or he's very, very happy to see this fruit tree be put into Quincy Market or into that space because you know, his inspiration comes from these markets in Seoul and he has great respect for the creativity there and so he's very happy to have his work be shown then in a marketplace. In fact, he says that um, he has this wonderful quote. He says, art, come down and play with us. You know, he, he would like to see, he, he has, is skeptical about, skeptical about the hierarchies that are enshrined in art museums. He's happy to see plastic next to paintings in the Evans Wing because that quest begins to ask questions about those hierarchies. And he wants to see art in malls and see you know, malls in art museums. He, he, he sees all of these things as interconnected. So nothing could make him happier than to have us put one of his works down by Quincy Market. Here's the place where it will go, um, hopefully on Friday. It's, it's a spot that is usually home, well, uh, in the wintertime, it's home to the Christmas tree. But um, if the weather cooperates and spring really has arrived, this fruit tree will take its place in a few days. Now, I just wanted to say that that quote, Art, come down and play with us, that's one of the things that I am stealing from him by way of the media guide, the, the MFA media guide. And um, Al and I just really wanted to make sure we put in a plug for the media guide. Every time we do a show in Gund, there's a guide produced 
But this one, I think everybody who worked on it really feels like everyone went you know, above and beyond what has ever been done with this before. And um, what, m what makes it so great is that it's not me. It's not Al talking. It's the artists talking. We sent them all I, um, iPad touches, I, whatever those things are. We had them videotape their studios and their, their cities, the places where they go. And we also did Skype interviews with them and recorded them talking about themselves and their work. So that's what you get in the media guide. And it gives you a really wonderful opportunity to hear them talk about their, their work. One more thing I wanted to mention, we wanted to mention, is that um, we, we, have, um, we would like to reflect a little bit on our own city after having done this project and, and um, take the opportunity of the exhibition to have some dialogue with, with you, you know, see if we can get some dialogue going among the people of Boston about our own city, which is, of course, also changing. And so one way we're going to do that is in, throughout the month of June, we will have two artists from Jakarta, also a megacity, also one of Asia's megacities, um, here in Boston as artists in residence. They will be doing a project that they're calling Urban Play Playing Data. They have a project called Urban Play that they've done several times um, in Asia and in Europe, but never before in America. And it's something where, it's a project in which they spend quite a long time, a month in this case, exploring a city, and they tend to gravitate towards sort of neglected areas or overlooked communities, marginalized populations, neglected structures. And they, they gravitate towards those kinds of places and they use what they find there and the people they talk to there to develop an interactive performance, often in, involving the found objects that they encounter in these spaces. And so they will be doing a Boston-specific iteration of this, um, developing it during the month of May, and then it will culminate in a performance on the MFA campus on July 8th. So I think hopefully we will learn a little bit about Jakarta and a lot about ourselves and our city through this, um, through this residency and performance this summer. And with that, with that, I will close. And I think we have time to take questions. So Al and I will both be here if anyone wants to ask something. Thank you. So before we begin the Q&A, I just wanted to add one shop or structure that also exists in these mega buildings in mega Asia, and that's the spa. Like, don't forget about the bathhouse that's in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand, and we'll bring the microphone to you. Hello, I have a statement and a question. My statement is that I lived in Korea, in Seoul, in between 56 and 57, and I used to walk the woods that were all around me. And from the, they were higher up, and you could see the old Korean houses with the upturned eaves and the, lo and the family gods under the eaves. And they, they were not destroyed. What was destroyed was a parliament building halfway in, from where I live. My second question, my question is, when were these slums in Bombay? that you mentioned, the big one. I lived there too, and I don't remember such a huge slum when I lived there for two years. So if you can tell me, when, when did they start those slums? I, um, I don't know how old they are, but they have definitely been around for decades. Darby has been around for decades, so um, I'm not sure when, when you lived in, in Mumbai, but it's not an, it's not, it's not overnight, so it, it's, it's, quite a deli, it's quite a Mumbai establishment at this point. I mean, I think it's important to point out, too, that, for instance, Rio has equally large slums, favelas. And these places have been around for a long time, but it's the growth of the slum to take up the amount of space it does and have the density of population that has really happened in more recent years. And that relates also to the idea of the migration of people coming into the city. And where's the first place you can find housing in an expensive and crowded city? So sometimes Darby is a transitional place where people might move in and then eventually find something more permanent and move out, and where other people stay for a long period of time. Uh, just on the theme of recycle, reuse, 
what will happen to the pieces in the Gondon around the museum? It almost seems like some of them, you know, could be discarded or, you know, what? Um, well, a combination of things. I mean, a lot of them go back to the studio and get shown again as artworks. Um, the Green Landscape by Hansa Kuhn is sort of a both things. He tends to reuse those materials in subsequent projects, just in different formation. Though some of it, like we had crowdsourced some of the materials, like empty soda bottles, and those will just get sent to a recycling plant. Aditi Joshi's sculpture made of plastic bags is literally shredded, just destroyed and recycled. It never has another life as an artwork. So there's a variety of things. Well, she does sometimes. Oh, that's right. She makes photos, but it doesn't go back into a sculptural form. Hi, a specific question about the Ai Weiwei snake ceiling. Why was um, the snake particularly used, especially in this installation, since he's done a couple different backpack um, installations things? This was the first backpack project he did. He's done more backpack things. Even very recently in Germany, he's been using backpacks. Um, but I, as a man of great complexity, sometimes I think he has a deep answer, and sometimes I think he doesn't have any answer. Um, but you know, some people have asked things like, is the snake related to the Chinese zodiac? And it's not. Um, this really is more of an evocative architectural intervention. And in every museum where it's shown, the shape is sort of different, but that's really made by the artist in accordance to the space and the way he thinks that the space is best physically activated by the materials. Ours isn't the biggest. It's been much bigger other places. Uh, 1992, 93 was a huge transition period. Uh, I was in both Mongolia and, and uh, Beijing at that time. And you're right, the, the bicycle culture was enormous in Beijing, but uh, particularly in Mongolia, where the Russian influence uh, was waning and the Chinese influence was increasing. Uh, the architecture and construction was so shabby that uh, buildings were dilapidated and falling apart that had been less than 10 years old in, in Mongolia and were being built by the Chinese, which were far superior that had been 20 and 30 and 40 years old. And the construction that was going up was amazing. And the, the new, new uh, era of construction began at that time. Thank, Thank you for you. that comment. Next mm -hmm. question. We'll go in the back there. Uh, the, the, is the, uh, the, inter, the media event uh, available only at the entrance to the exhibit, or is it available online so we can access it? About half of it is available online. Each artist has um, an artist statement, and that is available online. The video that is about the individual work of art and works of art are available um, only in the guide. Could you comment on any uh, political or governmental problems you ran into in dealing with particularly the Chinese artists? We didn't really have any, but I will say that for Nancy, for our colleague in the Chinese department of the museum, she did have concerns about, for instance, how might showing the work of Ai Weiwei, a famed political dissident who was still on house arrest at the time we were planning this, impact her relations with the Chinese government, for instance, for loans, or the work that she has been doing in the Forbidden City as a sort of guest historian for decades. Um, so those were complicated conversations, but nothing no trouble came out of any of them. So we were just trying to prepare ourselves for what might happen, but we didn't have any problems. I have a question about urbanization, and I wonder if you could go to your third last slide where you said two out of 10 people. Yeah, that, no, that, yes, there. Um, relating that to the beginning where you talked about the, the pace of urbanization and the fact that um, the impression is that it means poverty, but it really means correlated with rising per capita income. What I wonder is, that's only one parameter. I've wondered if for long periods of time, the urbanization of some areas, Asia and elsewhere, have meant a rising um, inequality and 
poverty is not just a function of GD of per capita income, but the cost of living goes up in the cities. And I'm suggesting that as you get rising inequality, for the bottom half, it really is increasing poverty because it's much tougher to live there than in the urban areas. The cost of living is astronomically higher. So um, I don't think everything about urbanization, I'm suggesting, given more statistics, is all good for all the people. No, certainly not. And I didn't, I apologize if I suggested that. I instead want to, intended to suggest that there are, there are ways in which it is of great benefit to some people. But I think you're right. There is, um, in many of these cities, very severe inequalities. The, the, the slums make such a striking contrast to those, those high-rise uh, luxury buildings. And so absolutely not. There, um, it started I, in 1730 uh, and 40 in London when you, know, you had this enormous um, you know, industrialization and a lot of wealth. But then you have the giant push in inequality and a lot of poverty. The one thing I'll just say is that there are other graphics developed by Northeastern downstairs outside of Gund, outside of the exit. Um, and there are places where they take a lot of different factors into uh, drawing on data from the UN. And they look at equality indices from these different cities and pollution and population rates of change, all different factors. Um, and they compare them um, for each city. It's a little bit hard to describe, but it's a place where you can see a much more complex picture of the of the data side. And in fact, you see for one for you know one thing that comes to mind is that Beijing turns out to be remarkably equal. It rates very high on the equality index relative to the other cities in the in the exhibition. So you can see the um, the equality issue represented there. Our next question will be all the way in the back. I just had a question about the installation, where so many of the pieces came over and then people from the MFA actually put them together rather than the artists. And I wondered if that was something that is common or kind of unique to this exhibit. Well, actually, more than half of the works in the exhibition involved the artist, and I would say that is less common. We are used to putting things together for other people in their absence. That's what a loan usually does. But we were thrilled to have more than half of the artists here. They weren't necessarily all here at the same time. We sort of had to pace ourselves and spread it out just because of the sheer pandemonium that sort of ensues when you have an artist plus 10 people working on something 10 feet away from someone else doing the same thing. But over the course of three plus weeks, we had more than half of the artists in and out. And even those who aren't here have a tremendous dialogue with us via Skype, via email that goes on for months and months and months to prepare our staff for doing things to their specifications. Yeah, I'm, of the works of art in Gund, only the one artist who's unfortunately deceased and, um, and no, but even oh, Sabota was here. There's only two pieces in Gund that were not personally installed by the artist. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today, and congratulations to Laura Weinstein and Al Miner.